Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Amen. Our series uh, for these Wednesdays are real, real time, real people, real Savior. And, And what we're trying to get across there is that lots of times we talk so much about the cross and we talk so much about how Jesus suffered and we and we put it into cartoon form sometimes for goodness sakes and and we do all these things and we begin to forget or it dulls in our memory or our minds that this was all real that the suffering was real the time and place was real and the people surrounding Jesus were real And we see ourselves in them and how Jesus came to them. Last week, we looked at at the absent and the missing, and and we talked about how um, the disciples weren't there, and they should have been, right? Uh, Just like we are sometimes. We're not with Jesus. We're somewhere else. And we thank God that Jesus was not absent, that he was present, uh, and he went the way of the cross, and because of that, we're, we're his. Today, uh, we look uh, at, uh, this evening rather, we look at this idea of, of the haters. I love this Psalm uh, 22. It's called a prophetic psalm. It prophesies uh, how Jesus will die on the cross. And, and what's interesting is this psalm was written uh, even before uh, they had crucifixion as a means of, of, of killing someone, right? Of, of executing someone. And yet you can see crucifixion all through this. It is really quite a, a prophetic psalm. And in there it says this, many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan. Now, now what this means was that there is an area there in, in uh, Israel that it, it actually, were, the bulls were strong there. It, it was great pasture land, right? So this is talking about very strong animals. Uh, they encircle me. So bulls are encircling him and roaring lions tearing their prey open their mouths against me. What's being described here? The haters around the cross. Here's the cross. I'm poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. That's what happens on the cross. Everything comes out of joint, you see? And, and, and you're, 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 you're bleeding everywhere, so you're losing fluids, and you're so dry, you see? So, that this, so I'm poured out like water, my bones are out of joint, my strength is dried up like a potsherd, I'm so dry, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. I am so thirsty. This is a perfect description of what's happening to Jesus on the cross. And as he's going through this, the people around him, the bulls around him, and the, and the wild animals, they're circling and they're opening their w- mouths wide. They're, they're, they're mocking him. They're making, they're hating him with their words. huh? And then again, this psalmist says this, dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. So you had a pack of dogs around him. They're evil men. They divide my garments among them and cast lot for my clothing. They even take my clothes off my back. Here again is a picture of the haters around him. And here's the cross. I can count all my bones. Can you see that? You can look down and can see all his ribs. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. There's the haters. This prophetic psalm is it's so amazing that it told this story a thousand years before it came to be. So where do you see these haters in flesh and blood around the cross? I, I think you first find them with the Roman soldiers. Uh, it says that, that Pilate handed Jesus over to, to be crucified, but first he had him flogged, which means he had 40 lashes and, and his back was already way, uh, laid open to the very bone. And yet, what did these soldiers, these Roman soldiers, do to him? They they didn't have to do this. They could have just taken him to the cross, but this is what they did. They mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews. They spit on him. They took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. Hatred seething from them. They had no, no empathy with this man, of this suffering man. They... Their heart didn't go out to them. They they just added to his pain. You know, I I, I was thinking through this, and um, 
I thought about this idea of hatred, and I, and I said, well, how, how is that defined? So I, I looked it up, and this is how it's defined. Hatred is a feeling of intense or passionate hostility, usually deriving from fear, anger, or a sense of injury. What did these soldiers have? Were they afraid of Jesus? No. Were they angry with Jesus? No, I don't think so. I mean, they, they, they were just kind of on duty, you know. Were, were they had a sense of injury? I, I don't think... What the heck were they hating for? And then it struck me, it made all kinds of sense. You see, this was a hatred that engulfed them, a way of life. A way of life. Can you relate to that at all? Do you ever live angry? Somebody better not get in your path today. There was no reason for their hatred. It was just a way of life. You see this towards the end of this reading too with the, the, the thieves that were dying on the cross with him. That w this is what happened there. It says, well, I'm sorry, you, you missed something for me. Do you have one before that? Um, okay, uh, I'll tell you what, go, go back uh, for me. One more. All right, so um, right after this one, we're going to talk about the idea that the, that the thieves on the cross, they also hurled insults at him. Huh? Why would they do that? Were they angry with him? Were they afraid of him? Did they have a sense of injury with him? No, they were engulfed in hatred, in a way of life as well. So almost like bookends in this reading, the Roman soldiers and the thieves on the cross who were dying with him, right? It was almost that, that hatred had engulfed their lives. And they knew no other way. That still happens in our world. In fact, maybe that's a good description of our world. You ever get caught up in that? Now, there were others that they were afraid of him, and they were angry with him, uh, uh, and they had a sense of injury with him. They, they, they were fearful, huh? These were the, the leaders of the Jewish people and the people themselves. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. You know what they're saying? You came and you shook up our way of life. You, were, you said the, the very temple, the thing that we not only worshipped him, but that we worshipped, was going to come tumbling down. And that you yourself would replace it. They were afraid of him. They understood that he came to change their whole way of life. The leaders were the same way. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of law, the elders mocked him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. They knew that he saved others. You see, there's a place where he raises Lazarus from the dead. And in response, these folks, the chief priests, the teachers of law, and the elders said, we got to kill him. They were, they, they were not amazed that he raised him from the dead, that he must be who he said he was. They were afraid that he would take, that because of him, their place of power and prestige and their way of lording it over the people to make themselves rich would be taken away. They had a lot to fear because of him. There was good reason to be angry because of him. He came and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, not you. You're not the way, the way, and the truth, and the life. I am. He turned their world upside down, and they didn't want to turn it upside down. They wanted to be God. They wanted to be in charge. I was talking about this with somebody, and... and um, the very first Christians, you know, they were, they, they, they were executed by the drugs. I throw it in the call saying, why? Because they had the audacity to say that Jesus Christ is Lord and not Caesar. 
That's why they were murdered. Jesus had the audacity to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not you. That's why he was hung on a cross by these folks. And, and it, wasn't, it wasn't just with that statement. It was with his whole, all the words he said challenged challenged these people as they wanted to create their own way of life. He talked about such things as these. He talked about adultery, and he said, well, you say it's, not, it's against the law to commit adultery. I tell you, if you look at a woman lustfully, you are committing adultery. How does that make you feel? You want to argue a little bit on that one? It's not as bad, right? You ever want to argue with Jesus about the sex thing? About sexual morality? Oh, I can do that. It's okay if I do this. I know he said that, but this is pretty straightforward. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and my words are true. And they talked to him about marriage in, in, in Matthew 19. See, they had this whole system set up. They had a way to get a divorce anytime they wanted. They had all these rules. My goodness, if a, if a wife burned the guy's food, he could get a divorce. They had all kinds of ways to get a divorce, and so they, they, they approached him on this. And he went back to the beginning. He defined what humanity was. He defined humankind as male and female. And so what do males and females do when it comes to marriage? They make this commitment for a lifetime to love and to cherish each other as, as husband and wife. This is why a man, a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. This is how Jesus defined things, you see. And he says, and what God has joined together, let no one put asunder. You want to argue with that? You want to be your own kingdom? You want to be the way, the truth, and life? That's what the haters did. That might just put us in their camp, huh? Here's another one. He says, store up treasures in heaven, not on earth. Ooh. What do you do with that one, huh? And he says, for what you, where are your treasures, there will your heart be also. And then he says, no one can serve two masters. <laughs> for your treasures, there will your heart be also. He says, no one can serve me. You want to argue with that? Everybody wants to argue with that one. Everybody wants to ride the rail, huh? I want treasure here and now. I'll try to do both. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he says. And if we throw in our lot anywhere else, making ourselves the way, the truth, and the life, we're part of the haters. Here's another one in Luke. Give the tithe, but also seek justice and the love of God. These, the, 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 the leaders of the people, they, they would give their tithe, their 10%. But he's saying, no, I, I want more out of you. I want a life that brings justice and love into the lives of people. Do you want to argue with anything in there? Do you hate the idea that Jesus says to give the tithe? Do you hate the idea that Jesus says to bring justice and love into our world? And, and you know, when, when we say that, we immediately think of the people we like. One of the things I've noticed lately in politics is that everyone, everybody wants to bring justice and love into the people that's on their side, but not those that they're against. Jesus doesn't make that distinction. I am the way, the truth, and the life, he says. If we throw in our lot somewhere else, we're part of the haters. Here's another one. Love your enemy. Do good to those who hate you. And finally, this one. You have, this, you have said, do not murder, but I tell you, whoever is angry with his brother will be subject, subject to the judgment. I mean, I can't even get angry with people. I can't even get angry at my enemy. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, lots of times we... Um, we see those who bloodied Jesus up, the Roman soldiers, or, 
or, or, or the, the, the thieves on the cross who had such hatred for him, or the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the leaders or even the people who, who were wagging their tongues and were so hateful towards him. And we say, oh no, that would never be me. But it's funny, when Jesus, um, when Jesus told the story of, of what would happen when he comes in all of his glory in the judgment, he said this, Whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers, you did for me. And he went on and said, whatever you don't do for one of the least of these, you don't do for me. Can you measure up to that? I can't. If you can't either, it puts us in this camp, the camp of the haters. We are the haters. So what did Jesus say to them and to us? What did he say as he agonized on the cross? As the beatings, the extra beatings the soldiers gave him. As he suffered through the cross, even with those beatings, with the, with the people making fun of him and mocking him, if you are the son of God. You know? What were his words to them? The very first words he spoke from the cross were these. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Those are the words of the Savior who was and is the Son of God to the haters, us included. May the Spirit of God tonight empower you to receive these words, to be washed clean in that blood that flowed from the cross and to begin a new way, brand new, like a resurrection to no longer live in hate, but live with Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, and to love as he guides and directs our lives. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, it's so easy uh, to wag our heads uh, at those who hated Jesus. Show us by your spirit that... Um, Every time we turn our backs on his words to us, every time we turn our backs on his claim that he is the king of kings and lord of lords over our lives as well, we join that group. And Lord, help us be in awe at his words to us. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And in that awe, brand new, to live a different way, to receive his love, and to live in that love and guidance in our lives. Pray in your name. Amen.